Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger, and I'm filling in for Brian Broom, which feels weird to say because I hosted this podcast for a long time. <laughs> and now, now I'm just here filling in. I'm, I'm the second fiddle today. It's sad. It's sad. <laughs> but we, well, we do miss Brian. Yeah, we are thankful for him, but he is ill right now. Yeah, so we can be praying for his recovery. We have been talking about the reign of Solomon. We're sort of moving on today to talk about a time when a leader of Israel thought, you know, you really need to see the Lord your God. And what better image than calves made of gold? We're in Exodus, right? (laughs) Well, no, actually not. But apparently Jeroboam had read Exodus. See, because if you read the Bible, then you'll do exactly what it says. (laughs) (laughs) And and this was a a recommended course of action, was to build a golden calf. Well, but see, no, Moses was opposed, but Moses was mean and narrow-minded and cruel and and power-hungry. And he wouldn't let people... Kind of puritanical. Yeah, he wouldn't let let people pursue the old-time religion, because, I mean... You need to be, okay, we better stop this before someone comes in and just says this. (laughs) Okay, switching off the sarcasm. (laughs) Sarcasm at rest. Well, let me read uh, at some length, so we don't have to keep going back to it, the the relevant section from 1 Kings. This is chapter 12. And uh, what's happened so far, I won't read the whole chapter is that Solomon has died and Rehoboam, his son, is up for being king. But Israel was not, um, the the, the succession was not automatic. The tribal heads had to agree to the new king. So in that sense, it was something of a confederacy. Although God had made very clear as to which family was supposed to rule still, case by case, the people had to agree at some level. Jeroboam had made himself a nuisance back in the days of Solomon and in consequence was forced to flee to Egypt. But now with him dead, he comes back to represent the northern tribes and they summon Rehoboam, the heir apparent, to Shechem, which is in the tribe of Ephraim. This is already not looking too good. So we have the rabble rouser of the previous generation acting as a spokesman for tribes and telling the new would-be king, you're going to come into our territory and talk with us on our ground. And we're going to set some uh, parameters for your kingship. But Rehoboam, to this point, wisely goes along. And he finds out that they want a lower tax burden and no constricted labor and just general, kinder, gentler sort of rule. And he, uh, Rehoboam tells the crowds, all right, well, let me think about it. Give me three days. He goes to the older men who stood with his father and they say, yeah, do that. Be nice to them. Speak peaceably. Back off a little here and there. And They'll serve you. Then he goes to the guys he grew up with. So these people would be in their late 30s and 40s. He says, what shall we answer them? And they say, oh, you got to be real tough. You got to threaten them. You got to tell them they're so slacky. Who do they think they are? And that's the line that Jeroboam or that Rehoboam takes. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we any inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then Rehoboam sent to Doram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones. And then he died. He sent the tax collector, and the tax collector was um, killed, murdered. Therefore, King Rehoboam made him speed to get up to his chariot and to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. He proposes war. I'm going to skip along here a little bit. But God sends a prophet and says, no, this thing's for me. Back it off. And he does. Then Jeroboam, this is verse 25, <clears throat> built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, 
Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. They shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Set the one in Bethel and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that's in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he'd made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places, which he had made. So he offered upon the altar, which he had made in Bethel, the 15th day of the eighth month, even the month which he had devised of his own heart. And he ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. And this practice of worshiping golden calves is something that the rulers of the northern kingdom perpetuate to the end. With the exception of one king only reigning for a week, we are told of each of them, and they walked in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebad, who made Israel to sin with the golden calves and Dad and Bethel. Uh, it's important as we look at this to understand that in his mind, well, maybe not in his mind, in his public proclamations, in the printed material, in the handouts, <laughs> in the telecasts, uh, he was not advocating that Israel worship a new God. He was saying, this is your God. This is the same God. This is the God that brought you about the land of Egypt. We're just putting a face on him. True, it's the face of a cow, but, you know, there's historical precedent for that. <laughs> and um, the cow just makes God so much gentler and easier to understand. And besides now, you won't have to take that long, hard trek to Jerusalem. You can stop at Bethel along the way and visit the gift shops. After all, Jerusalem is so much further. It's all 15 miles further on. Um, and, um, yeah, it's it's going to be a, a, a more user-friendly religion with a God you can see and touch. I don't know if we let you. Maybe that's the extra line where they charge a buck fifty. But uh, that that's it. The motives, of course, were purely political. He realizes that if the same religion dominates both countries, the people will continue to go to the temple, they'll go to Jerusalem, they'll see that kingdom, they'll rub shoulders with people who are citizens of that kingdom and who are still loyal to the sons of David. And they may begin to think, you know, what, what, what were we doing there? This, this is where we belong. And eventually <clears throat> they'll raise some kind of revolution and he sees the worst possible thing. Um, they'll kill me and they'll, they'll go back and, you know, can't have that. Even though God has promised to bless me in this kingdom if I obey him, I don't want to trust that. I want to, I want to trust my own political machinations. And he does. And it seems to work. Seems to. <laughs> So that's what we're talking about, why politics and the worship of images go hand in hand. It's interesting that the continued worship at Jerusalem would have recognized an imperfect king, that you have Solomon on the throne before he dies. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to continue to submit to the worship of Yahweh at Jerusalem, you're acknowledging that God put this guy on the throne and he's mm. got 700 wives and 300 concubines and isn't ruling justly. He's multiplying chariots. He's making alliances with foreign nations. And yet you're still supposed to do that instead of making your own religion because. Ooh, that's, that's <laughs> touchy. I think you're being too judgy here of some people. I wouldn't want to say who or anything. but Didn't have anyone in mind. <laughs> don't have to have anyone particular in mind for that one. Yeah, the powers that be aren't doing their job, so let's go create our own church, our own religion. And it will vary in just a very few particulars. But you know what? To get the, and this was his argument, or this was his implied argument, I guess. I don't think it's an argument. It's an implied manipulation. Let's go back, as you said earlier, to the old time religion. There, there's some things in the text that are easy to pass by. They called Rehoboam to Shechem, and then after all of this, we're told that Jeroboam rebuilt Shechem. Shechem is a city 
<clears throat> with deep roots in the Old Testament, goes all the way back to Genesis. It's where Abraham landed when he came into the land, and Jacob after him. It's also where the slaughter of uh, the Shechemites by Levi and Simeon took place. So there's a lot wrapped up in then and that. And then Penuel, that's where uh, Jacob wrestled with God and saw God face to face and came away limping, halting in the promised land. And then finally, Bethel is where Jacob saw the ladder to heaven, the angels ascending and descending, and where um, Jacob said, this will be the house of God. It's, actually, he said, this is the house of God. When I come back, this will be God's house. It would not be until much later that, as far as we can tell, that any formal structure was built, although Jacob may have put up a tent or something. But there, later on in the book of Judges, Bethel becomes the place where the tabernacle stays for a while. There are a couple of references uh, in Judges where it speaks of going to the house of God. Well, the house of God is Bethel. And the tabernacle would have been pretty far away, whereas Bethel was real close. So more likely that's what's going on there. They went there. Well, actually, at that point, they would have been the same thing. So um, he, he's playing with places, names, that have a deep historical significance, that go back before Moses, back before the Ten Commandments, back before the Mosaic Covenant, back to the time of the patriarchs. And without necessarily saying in so many words, this is the old time religion, he sure seems to be implying it, particularly when he says, these are your gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt, or this is your God. The words Elohim, and it can be either plural or singular, depending upon context. This is what Aaron said at the foot of Mount Sinai, when he presented Israel with the single golden calf and said, this is your God, same words. So again, he's pushing us back and saying, it, it's, it's not an accident. It's not that he read a book that no one else knew and found something cool that he thought he would borrow. This is something that everybody would have known. And the, the uh, appeal to it is very deliberate and obvious. In other words, Aaron got it right. He was the first high priest, after all. It was Moses who came down and inserted the law on top of this. So we need to go back behind Moses to what was really going on there first, and therein find this kind of gentler religion that is more user-friendly. And I think that, that modern expression is very relevant here. The, the one thing we're told in terms of appeal is it's too, far for, it's too hard for you to go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is 15 miles further on. It wasn't that big a deal. Another day's <laughs> journey at most. Yeah, that's not even a day. That, yeah, that's <laughs> not, you know, it's, but he made a big deal out of it. And of course, um, if we go back to the Exodus account, the people had appealed, we don't know what's become of Moses, up make us gods that shall go before us. That is, they, they weren't asking for a replacement for, for Yahweh, for Jehovah. They were asking for a replacement for Moses. Moses has been our leader. He's been gone for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, we want something we can latch on to. We want someone we can see, someone who is a visible uh, representation of this invisible God of ours. And it's not something scary like those fires and thunderings on the top of a mountain. We want something down here close that we can relate to. And Aaron picked a calf. Uh, there's the general trend of the commentators over the centuries, I think, failing to see an obvious precedent in scripture is to go back to Egypt and talk about the Apis bull, who was an incarnation of Osiris, and say, well, this is where they got it. And that was a big thing in Egypt. They just borrowed it. That may have played into it, but we're never told that. And the basic principle of hermeneutics is to start by interpreting scripture with scripture first, and then possibly appeal beyond it to what we know of geography and culture and the surrounding area. And when you start thinking calf in scripture, particularly in terms of Exodus and Leviticus, something should stand way out, and that's the calf that was used for sacrifice. Now, if Jeroboam had said, or Aaron had said, uh, here's a golden lamb, behold your God, we would get exactly what he meant. Mm -hmm. Or in, in the 20th century, 21st century, if we said, behold a golden lion, <laughs> we would probably get that one too. But that's because the New Testament spends more time calling Jesus the Lamb of God or the Lion of God than it does calling him the Bull of God, although there are certainly references to the sacrifice of, of calves and bulls and so on. But the, the bull was the expensive sacrifice. It was the sacrifice for the nation or for the priest or for somebody really important. 
or if you really wanted to do some kind of big covenant renewal service, the bull was going to be the first thing on the offering menu. And, and so to pick that was, uh, was simply to exalt the sacrifice, hold up the sacrifice as if it were divine. Oh, wait, this is sounding familiar from another direction. <laughs> now, so let's elevate the host and everyone can bow down to it. This, this, this is exactly, what, well, one of many reasons, but central to why God forbade idols is once we see them, we accept them as reality. And then we do the next logical thing. We submit ourselves to them. We bow down to them. We worship them. We can say all we want that, no, we're not really worshiping it. We're just showing it respect because it's an image of the reality. <laughs> we can use a different word like veneration. <laughs> yeah, venerate. Veneration. No, we're not worshiping it. We're just venerating it. It's, it's worship level two, not worship level one. <laughs> um, but the, act, second, the second commandment forbids us not only to make idols and have them, but to bow down to them. We are not to bow down to anything, uh, any creature, as if it is God. We can bow to humans because they are the image of God, a God-made image of God. But we do not bow down to them as divine. We bow down to them as, as humans who deserve our respect. And so we see various patriarchs and prophets bowing to kings, and this is fine. They're not transgressing the law of God. But when you start, and you can kneel in front of something, you want to kneel in front of a car to change a tire. You're not worshiping the car. <laughs> yeah, the uh, bowing or, down is sort of a figure of speech uh, metonymy for worship. You know, it's not it, it, the act yeah. of sitting on your knees is somehow forbidden. Yeah. Uh, however, itself. however, the flip side of that, you said metonymy, but that means that there is a part here you are taking for the whole, and the part is that worship traditionally has involved bowing. Now, mm -hmm. Western Christian, no, American Christianity. <laughs> Uh, particularly evangelical fundamentalist Protestant Christianity has gotten, Reformed Christianity has gotten away from that. We don't bow anymore. If you go to a Lutheran church or an Episcopalian church, an Anglican church, you're likely to see people bowing. But we've gotten away from that in a sort of Gnostic, well, that's high churchy, that's something else. All God cares about is my heart. If I'm bowing in my heart, there's a danger there. There's a very real danger. The danger being the implication that it doesn't matter what you do with your body. It doesn't matter what you do with your body. And therefore, this is the other side of it doesn't matter what you do with your body. So there's this big golden image and the music's playing and we've been told to bow down and worship it. So this would be a great time to bow down and tie my shoe. Because I'd be <laughs> bowing and, you know, but my heart wouldn't mean it. So it would be okay, say the three Hebrew children to one another, not. <laughs> they didn't try. I mean, I've had, I've talked through that chapter. I don't know how many times. They well, who wants to have the question? Well, couldn't they just, you know, bow their knees as long as they weren't bowing their hearts in so many words? The thing is, no. their, their hearts and their knees all exist within a cultural context. Yes. Where yeah, to things, bow. Things matter. It matters. And to bow the knee before an idol is to worship an idol. So submit yourself to the idol and the reality and the worldview it represents. And so uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow to the idol. They stood standing. They were willing to show respect for their king as a human king, and in that sense, a, an instrument and representation of God. But they were not going to let that king, let alone an idol, usurp Jehovah's place. They were going to stand straight, even if it meant going into a fiery furnace. So this, th there are issues within issues here. When we detract from the significance of man's true humanity as a physical creature in a physical universe, of a creature that has legs and arms and knees and eyes and nose and mouth and hair and torso and all that, and sexuality and speech and sight, and we say, well, that's just the empty shell, that's the dressing. The real man is somewhere deep inside. Do not tell this to a psychotic child with a really sharp knife, because he may want to get the <laughs> person who's inside out of the body and free him, her, from being trapped there. Because just listen to the words. Where, where inside exactly? And does that mean that it doesn't matter what we do to your body because we can never touch you? Now, there is, to be sure, a sense in, in when we say that that which is deep is that which was in the heart cannot be touched directly by human hands. That's 
absolutely true. And if we if we step away from that, we begin to bring good works into the gospel or ritual or rite or something else that will infuse grace by force from the outside. But at the same time, when the heart embraces something, the body embraces it too. And when the heart rejects something, the body will embrace it, will reject it too. Because that's the that's the nature of humanity. Man is a unified whole. The heart is, as it, as it were, the bridge, the steering wheel, the, the point from which all the issues of life flow. And that includes what the body will do. So we can't disconnect the two. We can't say that it doesn't matter what you do with your body in worship, because all that God looks at is the heart. No, he looks at the body too. It does matter whether you sing loud or not in church, whether you just mumble, whether or not you mouth the creeds or recite them joyfully, whether or not you hear with attention or whether you're just in the room with the pastor speaking. These are all actions we perform with our bodies, and they are basic to worship. And, and when we get away from that and, and, and limit it to well, my body went through the forms, so that's good enough for somebody. Or it's, I went through the forms, but I didn't really mean them. So I'm not guilty of idolatry. I just, you know, was doing what everyone else was doing because an idol is nothing in the world. And there's no other God but one. So I can eat the meat offered to, to idols, even though it meant going to an idol festival and getting splashed with their blood. I wanted a good steak dinner at the end. You know, that's not what Paul's talking about when it comes to Christian liberty. Physical worship is real worship, and we can talk about cultural connotations, but there are there's some absolutes here where God says, don't bow down to images that claim to be God. Don't submit yourself to them. And even though they claim, and, and here's the other thing, the second commandment is not about primarily bowing down to false gods. That was covered in the first commandment. Don't have false okay. gods. Don't have any yeah. other gods. The second commandment is, and when it comes to me, don't make images of me. And this is where I, I almost always go these days because it drives the point home, so I'm going to do it again anyhow. Think of a marriage where a, a woman discovers her husband has been using pornography, and she calls him on it. And he says, but honey, I was all the time I did these things, I was thinking of you. Is that going to fly? No. No. 100% no. 100% no. <laughs> no. No, that's not. Or And, and she looks, and it's a picture of, I don't know who's a pop star today that would actually mean something. In my day, it was Marilyn Monroe, Monroe or someone <laughs> like that. Yeah, you know, it's uh, no. You, this is not. This is not looking all like me. Well, sure. I mean, her eyes are beautiful, just like yours, and her figure is great, just like yours, and she makes me feel warm and cozy, like you do. So, see, it's exactly the same thing for all that matters. No, no, <laughs> no, it's not. It's not, and yet somehow when it comes to pictures of Jesus pictures of God, we, we, we blow past that. Well, I know that this is not what Jesus looks like, but it makes me think of Jesus. Well, the calf made them think of God, so they claimed. And, and the reasons, well, it's the, sac it's the chief of the sacrifices. Well, it'll make you feel better if we substitute a golden lamb then. No, <laughs> but, but it's, it's a sacrifice. Yeah, no. Gold, well, it's rich and, and, and pure and valuable and reflects the glory of God. And think of all the golden things that are in the tabernacle. Golden showbread table, golden altar, golden menorah, golden ark, golden calf. It's just the next logical extension. And the calf is strong and uh, although meek, yet powerful. And yeah, I was going to say the bull is kind of the, the more uh, ferocious of the sacrifice animals <laughs> yeah like i was just reading ferdinand to gretchen the other day that was a non-ferocious example but the reason you have ferdinand is because bulls are scary bulls are sc scary especially in a culture that uh, still does bullfighting and in in israel the the bull is uh, it's an agrarian society so it pulls the carts uh that pulls the plow it's means of transportation it uh it just does so much. It's, it, it, the female version gives us milk. They give us steak occasionally, leather. I mean, it provides all of our needs, just like God. So it's just this, this really cool representation of God. And so when I see it, I, I know it's not God. Everybody knows that. But it reminds me so much of God, and I get this warm, fuzzy feeling. And it just helps me. I mean, maybe you're at that point where you don't need help. But some of us poor, simple believers just need a little bit of extra help from our friends to get along. So it's okay. And I'm sure God doesn't mind. 
And how are you going to decorate your house if you're not going to have little religious images? You'd have to have not religious images. Yeah, you'd that have would to have be less spiritual. Image. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, you need to bring God near by having lots of little images. And that way your house is much more spiritual if you fill it full of these little religious image things. These, in the Old Testament calls them teraphim, uh, little idols you put here and there. They weren't God exactly, but they were like angels or saints or representations of this divine attribute of that. It, it, it was a very spiritual religion. And I guess that's where we end up eventually. We, we haven't really even got to the whole political angle here, but I think in order to do so, we had to lay, lay this ground. The 20th century saw the separation, supposedly, of church and state, of religion and politics. But what we actually saw was the separation of the state from traditional Christian thought forms and practices. Man is a religious being, and you cannot yank religion out of him. You can't tear it out of his heart. In the absence of worshiping the true God, man does worship something. And in the 20th century and, and before that, basically from the Enlightenment on, or even from the Renaissance on, the the powers that unbelievers began to worship were those of the state. And the Enlightenment basically told us, grant the state all of its due attributes, omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, and it will come, it will give you utopia, it will give you paradise on earth, it will give you something your God always promised you. But we just need more knowledge, omniscience, more presence, bureaucracy and surveillance, and more power, the ability to make whatever laws are necessary to force forward our vision. And we'll give you paradise because after all, man is naturally good. And it's religion that's been complicating, meaning Christianity. So, but what they're offering is a different religion. It's not no religion. That's not possible. They, they offer this religion and therefore this sort of spirituality. And it can come cloaked very much in spirituality. In the crisis we've gone through in the West here in the last couple of years, it was interesting to see the fusion of the state says, science says, and don't you love your neighbor mm -hmm. into this mystical hodgepodge of, therefore, you will do exactly what you're told. You will not ask questions. You will not challenge the system and you will conform all of your values and all of your family practices and all your church practices to this new standard because it's the loving, spiritual, sweet, kind thing to do. It's what science says is necessary, and we know science. And besides, it's what your government says, and you are loyal patriots after all, aren't you? Uh, and it was a very winning combination for a while. Uh, there was enough cultural uh, baggage from uh, Christian capital and conservative capital to say, ah, uh, wait, sir, just a minute, please. Uh, but the battle's hardly done, and this is the direction that politics, that statism, will take religion. It will try to make religion a tool of the state. Now, that religion may not be Christianity. If Christianity is no longer popular, if it no longer holds the sway over human hearts, then it'll get dumped. It will become the persecuted minority. It will be pushed off as an extreme lunatic fringe, not true religion at all. And, but appeal will be made to some sort of religion. Jeroboam, in the context of a very active covenant life in Israel and Judah, appealed to what seemed to be at least one interpretation of how things had been. The old time religion, the religion before it got systematized and developed and learned uh, where it had to defend its borders, like no idols, to something where you could imagine what it was like, where, where there was more freedom and more love and you could follow your heart and your impulses and that which was truly spiritual. You know, we, we, and we still got this from the 19th and 20th century. We got a lot of this in the cults. Yeah, things were great in the early church. Then along came Nicaea with this Trinity thing and just destroyed it all. We want to go back behind all of that to the real old time religion, to how the apostles taught and lived, how the early church lived. We want to go back to Corinth and, okay, think what you're saying. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we want a real New Testament church. We want a real New Testament church. We want an apostolic church. We want a Pentecostal like church. Like <laughs> Corinth, you know. Now, there are senses, to be sure, in which all of those are true. We do want an apostolic church. And in the creeds, we confess one holy apostolic Catholic church. But it means something very specific. It doesn't mean 
we want to unwind time, go back to the beginning, and live out how we think it would have looked like. And and when we talk about, for instance, Pentecostal, yeah, there's a true since where Pentecostal is Pentecostalism is very important. The outpouring of the Spirit brought the church to new life in terms of Jesus' resurrection. We never want to forget that of the great work that God did then. And uh, old time, early church, first century church, what the, the Christianity described in the New Testament, of course that's what we want in a more mature, developed form, because they were babies and they were just learning. And, and the solution to the sins of maturity is not to go back and adopt childhood again, not become babies all over again. So we need to be care, we need to be aware of, be careful of that kind of verbiage because it's a trap. It's, it's, it leads us back away from the the maturity that Christ has worked in his church to something that is to something that's immature that lacks the boundaries the sensibilities the development the maturity of where Christ has brought us can i jump back and take a detour on this idea of user friendly mhm i think it's such an apt phrase for all the reasons you said and then also because it is manipulation cloaked in service Mm -hmm. that it ostensibly is, oh, it's making it easier for you when what's really getting easier is the maker of the thing controlling you and getting them, getting you to do what they want you to do, whether it's use the product, go to Bethel instead of Jerusalem. So I don't know. Maybe I'm on my anti-technology soapbox, well, <laughs> anti-big tech soapbox, but it's it just seemed very apt. Yeah, it's um, it's something we respond to, unfortunately, because when it comes to the worship of God, we are constitutionally, sinfully lazy. We we get up as late as we can. We don't do the necessary spiritual preparation. We squabble and fight on the way to church and then walk in with our plastic smiles uh, <laughs> stamped on our faces and begin the worship of the transcendent sovereign God. And then, you know, the pastor goes five or 10 minutes over and we start looking at our watches. Uh, worship is a difficult thing. It's difficult in the flesh. It's difficult for the natural man to submit himself wholly to God and to God's structure and God's purposes, even for a short time. And we use all the excuses that, well, it may, it may be God, but we've got a, uh, a mere sinful human up there, and he's gone over time and my, my rose is burning. You know, we, yes, this is the worship of God, but listen to the choir. They're horrible. We, we find things to complain about and, the, and, and then pretend, but my heart's in the right place. Well, apparently your heart's not in the right place, or you would be able to forego these externals. But the worship of God demands the whole man, beginning in the heart, but moving out into the body. But the worship of God demands humility. The real, the realization, and this is kind of where you started, that God puts us in an imperfect world with imperfect leaders, sinful leaders, who say stupid things and sometimes sinful things, even from the pulpit. And he expects us to submit to that, knowing that he's got it covered. The blood of Christ has atoned for all our sins and all our deficiencies, all our failures. Not to say we should not correct them as we can, but we don't have to wait until they're perfected to enter into them and enjoy them and participate in them. We do not need to say, well, I cannot go to this church because it does this, this, and this thing, when they're not exactly, they may not be exactly biblical, but they're not blatant idolatry, and they're done in, in, with an imperfect faith. Especially if that's the congregation of the Lord that's meeting in a place that you can get to on Sundays. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And and I'm going to go on a, a side tangent here and probably get myself in trouble in the process. The struggle between Christianity and the ancient world, its worldviews, philosophies, and religion, uh, came down to this. God has spoken truth in Scripture that is accessible to God's people. And if we do not have this truth, then we fall back into idols and demons. And this was absolutely correct. And so the martyrs fought and died in terms of this. For, for things that to our generation would seem silly. What do you mean you won't buy a license from the state to have your church open? It's just a little pinch of incense and some words that you don't even have to mean. 
Um, no, the, the martyrs went to the stakes and to the lions rather than say Caesar is Lord and to obtain that license. And on into the Middle Ages, as the church warred with local superstitions and pagan gods and chopped down pagan oaks and such, they continued to insist that truth is what matters. Without truth, there's no gospel. And along comes the Reformation. And again, it's willing to divide the church over the issue of truth. And so in the wake of the Reformation, we, we get this interesting situation, particularly in America, but to a lesser extent elsewhere, where there is no more state-sponsored church. And anybody really can set up a church and say, here's the truth. Now, what do you do with that? You can say, all right, well, these people, mostly I agree with them. They seem to be on board with what most of what God says, except for that one thing there. I don't know about that. These people, they're really off, but they seem to love Jesus. These people talk about loving Jesus, but they don't even seem to know who he is. And these people don't even seem to love Jesus, but they go through all the old traditional form. What are you, where is truth in all of this? And in the wake of the Reformation, there was a lot of conflict over, for instance, the doctrine of the Lord's Supper, transubstantiation, consubstantiation, real spiritual presence, real spiritual absence, whatever you have there. And wars were fought over this ultimately. And the idea that, yes, truth is important, it's enough to lay down your life for, but it isn't enough to go kill somebody for. That was a huge thing that, in, that Cromwell started to solve in England and lost a lot of Puritan support because of it, it was especially American Puritan support. But then in America, we get it full blown. The guy, I, I live next, well, in my case, I live next to a Lutheran, across from some Baptists, next to some Roman Catholics. You know what? We don't burn crosses on each other's lawns. <laughs> we, don't, we don't go about plotting how to get one in, each other drug before a civil magistrate for crimes of heresy. It wouldn't, even if such things were possible, it would never enter our minds. Does that mean that we now despise truth? Well, it might, but it also might mean that we understand that truth speaks to the heart and it cannot be forced by purely political means. Now, the secular state doesn't see it that way. Oh, yes, it talks a great deal about freedom of speech and all that. But more and more, as the state's taking control of the educational system, we have seen exactly the opposite of freedom of religion. We see the state more and more mandating what our children will be taught, that is, indoctrinated in, what values they will be required to, upset, to uh, accept, what values you as a family will be required to accept in order that your children be trained correctly. The state's reaching for the heart, which it does not acknowledge exists, mm -hmm. but it's reaching for the man on a biochemical level which is all they know of man. And so by reaching his total environment down to his DNA, they are trying to reshape man in terms of their religion, and it is a religion. Whereas Christians have learned, look, uh, you're Lutheran, you're Reformed, you're Presbyterian, you're Baptist, you're Methodist, and we actually do love and serve the same Jesus, although we have some serious disagreements on what he requires of us, but we do understand that we come to God through faith in him and that he's our savior. We, we, these are, there's a couple of, you guys, you don't know who Jesus is. I don't care what you call yourself. You think he's this brother of Lucifer. No, you're right out. At least you used to be. You seem to be remodeling your religion. I don't know what that's all about. Um, <laughs> but in any case, it doesn't mean we have to go kill people. Mm -hmm. We can fight with the sword of the spirit. We can fight on a spiritual level with prayer and love and compassion and the word of God and discussions and reasonings rather than go kill people. The state has one weapon, it's force. And it can adopt a prophet, a priesthood. It can adopt a spokesman to speak for its images. You know, the book of Revelation, we run into the beast, which is apostate civil government at some level. And, but the beast is accompanied by a false prophet arises out of the land. The beast comes from the sea, from the Gentile world. False prophet from the land, in those days, that would be the land of Israel. And it is the prophet who supports the beast and the prophet who makes the image of the beast and demands that men worship the image of the beast. Here we have a false religion setting up images for the beast, for, for raw political power, and requiring people to worship it. And if you don't do that, you can't play their game. You cannot buy and sell. And in Revelation, buying and selling is an image for participation in covenant life and worship and such. Jesus counsels the church of Laodicea to buy from him the things mm -hmm. necessary to the faith and the image 
proceeds along. Uh, so are we right to fear a, a confusion of church and state? Church and state, maybe not. Religion and state, absolutely. Because the state has to rest on some religious foundation. If it is not that of covenant life revealed in Scripture, it will be that of continuity of being, an idea we've talked about perhaps ad nauseum. <laughs> but if all reality is one, and the state is the best representative of that, then any deviation from that on the part of the subjects, the worshipers, cannot be tolerated. Everybody must be assimilated. Everybody must conform. After all, they love us, don't they? <laughs> on that note, wow. Um, talk about ending on a downer. Um, but we should go to recommendations because it's okay. that time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, do you have one? Your husband prefers when I you do. go first. Um, yeah. I recommend reading books out loud with people. <laughs> I think it's a great alternative to movie nights because like on some level, we pretty much all know what movies are out there and we pretty much all know which ones we are likely to enjoy. And then while it's on, you can't like socialize unless... <laughs> You know, it's got to be the right crew around you if you're going to, like, talk through the movie. Everybody <laughs> has to sign on to it and everything. But with a book, you can read as much as you feel like and then take a break and have some snacks and talk about it and then get back to it. And you're discovering something that probably nobody else has, like, read out loud to you before because we don't do that as a culture anymore. <laughs> and it's it's really fun. We did this on Monday night. We had a book read aloud party and it was a collection of short stories and it was a whole lot of fun so. um not exactly along those lines but sort of along those lines i want to recommend two books neil postman's amusing ourselves to death and neil postman uh probably called himself a christian um probably by our definitions a liberal one but at least he took the second commandment very seriously and thought you know what images and content matter. Uh, the book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, is at some points a little difficult, particularly his discussion of epistemology. He doesn't use the word quite the way I would use it. But it is worth following his argument of the relationship between words and images and how images tend to displace words and yet carry a power of their own, which is often beyond rational discussion because they're not rational propositions in the first place. There's a lot to be there. His whole chapter on um, images and religion, which I think he calls shuffling off to Bethlehem, mm -hmm. is uh, is worth the price of the book. But he also talks about how it applies to politics and so on and ties in uh, discussions of um, Fahrenheit 451, Brave New World and such. Similar is Arthur W. Hunt's book, The Vanishing Word, subtitled The Veneration of Visual Imagery in the Postmodern World. It's a crossways book. And it's in some ways, it's a watered down, Christianized form of the other book, uh, but probably more accessible language is a little easier. And you are dealing with, self with someone who's self-consciously Christian. The discussion, though, is, is very much the same. There is a danger in appealing to images because images bypass the rational. You look at a sunset or a piece of pornography and you have a reaction to the image, and you cannot say, wait, I don't believe that. Believe what? There's nothing to believe. You just responded. You responded at a gut level, an emotional level, visceral level, and, and you, you quickly move beyond rational discussion because there's no rational proposition in the first place. God gave us not a book, not a picture book. He gave us a book of words, and Jesus is the Logos, the divine word. We need to we need to recenter our thinking here. It does not mean that God has no place for images. Mm -hmm. uh, there and Jesus were, is the image of the invisible God. He's the image of the invisible God. He came down where we could see him, but we don't see him now. We have to read his love letter. We have to read his words, his commandments, his testimony, his gospel. So there is much to think about here and much to reorient our thinking about the culture and the wider world. So that's it. Amusing ourselves to death and The Vanishing Word. Awesome. I remember reading Amusing Ourselves to Death, but I'll have to check the other one out as well. Um, that is all we have time for today. So thank you so much, Greg, for this conversation. It's been a thank pleasure. You, 
Thank you also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband, who is currently watching my baby as she smiles at him. I hope. Maybe she's <laughs> yelling. Who knows? I can't hear. I have noise-canceling headphones. <laughs> Uh, thank you also to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Hope you had as much enjoyment and benefit from this episode as we derived from making it. If you'd like to join the ranks of our financial supporters, you can visit our website. That's anchor.fm slash halting toward Zion. Thank you, by the way, also to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. You can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble. I think that's it. I'm still on Goodreads. Be my friend. See you next week. <laughs>